uh, uh, you know, risk and other things like that. So there's always uh, ROI with these type projects. And, and done correctly, they can be done, you know, pretty, uh, pretty quickly. So now I'm going to, you know, kind of transition into a little bit of, um, you know, ways that you might approach this. Now, your, your development process and, and how you identify projects and bring things in, you know, may be totally different for your organization. Um, but this is some, some success that I have uh, witnessed in the past with other customers, as well as myself. If I go way back to how I got started in, in uh, business process management and in reengineering is, is uh, some time I spent at Motorola. And there I was a, a developer. Uh, that created workflow applications for, for our organization. And what we did at the time was create a small team. Um, we actually had three people on our team. Um, and, and then as we scaled out, we created additional teams of three um, to, to go across and attack these type of, of applications. And basically in one year, our, little, our first team that we did, a three-man team, we ended up saving over $8 million for Motorola. So the, the, huging was, or the savings was huge, and, and we got – you know, quite a bit of accolades, and it really kind of helped launch my uh, career as, as I kept moving through. So these are the things that, you, you know, you might want to think about doing and setting up this type of center of excellence. And then the methodology milestones, these are just some of the, the, the sample things that you might produce um, as you step through these, these projects. And so I've got a couple of slides to, to talk about the approach, and then we're going to start talking about, you know, how we're going to identify and, and, and deal with some of these. And then again, we'll get into to the demo pieces. But you know, when you're talking about business process management, you know, at a whole, it's always that cyclical: identify, define, deploy, manage, and analyze. Right? And, and analyze is, is certainly a very key um, piece to it. Which uh, you people that 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 are already leveraging lifecycle uh, and know lifecycle, that's an area that that I think. Adobe does really well as far as collecting a tons of information. They don't really do a great job of, of giving us that information out. So it's, it's a step that you have to, to make sure that you incorporate into, um, you know, your process and then the applications that you put forth. And then you'll notice on each one of them, you know, I added kind of a, you know, a little loop on top of it. And what that's really meant to be is each one of these, you should definitely be doing this as an iterative approach. Everything should be cyclical and everything should, should have the process owners uh, engaged into it, right? Um, so this is this is the type of, of process that, that um, you know we've seen as, as most successful as you're doing these type of applications. So when you're looking to identify opportunities, if you're if you're in that um, stage where, where you've got a limited use, and, and and so I see this all the time with with lifecycle customers who buy lifecycle to solve a specific need. We all know it has great um, you know services that it exposed around document management and PDF and things like that. So a lot of times that's what it's there for in the organization. It does one application or it was brought in for one application. Um, but if you really brought it out, start taking advantage of the, the platform, you know, you can really make this thing, uh, you know, quite, quite beneficial for the organization. So to get started on that, you know, what you want to do is identify, you know, three main themes, you know, low maturity, high impact, and make sure that it's a, a true business process and something that's going to fit nicely. When we talk about low maturity, what we mean by that is, is you know, a, the, the process is, is, you know, poorly designed, it's paper-based, it's, you know, all over the map. They don't have any visibility to it. They don't really know what's going on. Um, and then, you know, when we say high impact, it doesn't have to be that huge, massive project. As a matter of fact, sometimes that's what you want to avoid um, right away with these type. You, you want to, to try and get the ones that, that um, you know, are, are smaller in nature. And you can, as a matter of fact, our rule of thumb at Motorola is if we couldn't knock the project out in less than six weeks, then we really wouldn't take it. They had to go a different pro approach coming in. It had to follow the, the more typical IT approach. But they still were high impact in the sense that they involved our customers or our partners, um, you know, or that the, the organization just had no visibility into what this was really costing them. So the data we would give them would be uh, would be huge, right? And you know, and then the only thing I'll kind of mention on the business process, you want to make sure that it's not a um, you know a big large scale application. You know, you don't want to try and you know take the square peg through the round hole thing and, you know, create Excel in, 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 in a process. That's not what this is about. It's about, you know, taking process applications and, and putting that into place. Um, and, 
you don't want to use the thud factor when you're putting together your 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 designs for these things, right? And so here you Dilbert ca cartoon. I, I love this one, and and I'm I'm guilty of this, right? I have created documents that that you know when I say thud factor, that's the sound it makes when you land it on the desk, right? So, um, but if you do that, no one's going to read them. No one's looking at the requirements, um, and, and what you're going to end up with at the end of the day is not what the you know, business wants the, the the team is frustrated. So, you know, making it smaller as you're going through and being agile and iterative um, as you understand that process is going to be key, right? And so, when you're talking to this group to to, to potentially say, oh, "Here's a new process we're going to bring into to lifecycle," you know, include them in the in the thought, um, you know, in in the talks, but you know, challenge everything they, they, they want. Don't spend a ton of time, you know, documenting every little thing that they do. You know, really approach it from the outside in. What 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 is it that the end result does and, and, and you know how's the information used and things like that and why is it done and you know just keep challenging like that. Don't worry about what they're doing today. What they're doing today may be workarounds for, for limitations in the system or limitations in a process. So, you know, Understand it that way, but understand it at a high level. Um, when you're when you're modeling that into tools, you know, keep it at that high level. Um, I've even seen people use Workbench. You know, Workbench is obviously the development tool that you're going to create these applications in. I've and I've done it myself. Is use Workbench to actually model and lay things out, and it gets people thinking in the terms of true. Um, you know, process steps because one of the things that you're going to find as you as you're talking to people about their process is they're going to dump everything that that the person who may be at a particular step is going to be thinking about right and everything that they may have to do um, those are things that you may not be you know automating as part of a business process management solution those just may be job functions that stay within that particular role and you don't necessarily have to define it and, and make sure you do things if it's actionable then that's when we want to make sure we build it into our, our forms or applications or we're building functionality that's going to solve it um, so those are the kind of things you want to look at. Um, again, as you're mapping these things out, you know, generally what comes out first is a happy path. And what we mean by that is, you know, if everything works perfectly, this is where it's going to go. This is how the process works. Um, and there's many times that you'll you'll get finished mapping a process with with an organization, and that's as far as they'll have. They'll, you know, if everything's a happy path to them, they're not thinking about it really. And, and in reality, there's all kinds of process failures and things that can happen, exceptions to the process that you need to understand because you might be able to to automate them, right? And that may be where the big ROI is at, right? If you can stop some some you know things that that go wrong in a process. Sometimes that's the things that cost the organization big money, right? Compliance issues and other things like that. So, so that's really really key. But then you might also uncover something that's really going to be you know, you know, very tricky to to try and solve. Don't be afraid to to say, look, you know, that's phase two. That's later down the line. Let's let's draw you know, line in the sand and let's get something out, right? So so certainly look at that. Um, once you get to the deployment piece, again, keep in mind each one of these stages as you're going through should be as iterative as you can can be with um, with the stakeholders that you've brought in. Um, but you want to prototype everything, including options. And, and what I mean by options is things that you think about. You know, a fresh set of eyes and a fresh thought process to to what they're doing today can really sometimes shed incredible light. On on the job that may not always right. There's many times that you'll present something with the with the customer. You know, when I say customer, it could be you know internal group that you're talking to. But when you're going in there and presenting something, they go, no, 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 they don't understand. But and and once you get that, you're just getting a better understanding of what that process is, and it's going to make it that much easier for you to do process improvements on it. So so don't be afraid to share. You're never going to nail the perfect application. You know the first time out. It's just not going to happen. It's going to take multiple iterations to get it to where it needs to be. Um, and, and generally, it's, it's multiple analyzations and coming back you know, months later to fix processes is typically what you're looking at. Um, as you're iterating, again, you know, use cases, forms, you know, notifications, emails, different things that are going out, you know, all those should be iterated with the, the, the person and, and always challenge, always uh, you know, ask what ifs and things around that. Um, 
So, and then, you know, obviously once you get into build, we'll, we'll look at some of that. You're going to build the process in, into Workbench, and we'll see some of that with demos. Um, we'll, we'll pound on that. Once you get it deployed, you know, you're letting Lifecycle do its thing, let it manage, let the BPM tool do what it's supposed to do. Just make sure that you've, you're monitoring, um, you know, and you've got notifications set up. So it's, as the system, you know, if, if the process fails, if something goes wrong, you know, people are, you know, not, you know, someone should be, uh, notified of that right away. It shouldn't be the business that has to find out it days later and, and ask you about it. So, so make sure that you've got um, you know process in place to to uh, to get notified and handle you know anything that may be going on. Um, and then this is the piece that that I think a lot of people, you know, with lifecycle tend to to fall down a bit on, and and that's the 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 continuous improvement piece of it, right? And so one of the things that we did at Motorola, I mean, it, and for those of you who know Motorola, we we very much, you know, one of the first Malcolm Baldwin Award winners, and uh, very much Six Sigma, and, and it was all about process, right? So so that was just part of our culture there. So we reported on everything, right? We had scorecards, balanced scorecards, the whole thing. That's really important as you're putting together new lifecycle process applications. You should understand what data it is you want to report on as you're building that, right? Make sure the forms have it in there and make sure the process is, is pushing that data to where it needs to be when it needs to be there. Um, so that's really, really important. And then as you're putting these applications in, you should um, absolutely be scheduling you know, review cycles after the fact, right? Uh, you know, ours were always, you know, six weeks, eight weeks um, after we did our first implementation, there was always a scheduled review. And then, you know, the reviews just kept going because, you know, what what's really kind of funny, actually, you know, even when I was with Adobe, we, we were doing a, a gig at a client. We went out, um, mapped their process out. We had sticky notes, the, the big, you know, you know, two foot by three foot, papers we were putting those all over the wall that's how we were doing the process you know we thought it had we thought you know we spent a couple of weeks doing it we got it all done and, and you know the, the business owners really seemed to know what they were doing we, we thought we were really um, knocking it out of the park there once we went live with that project what we noticed is they didn't understand their process at all it was breaking down right at the beginning they were having to all the time go outside of the process that we mapped so their happy path was really almost an exception path. It very seldom went that way. They thought it did because it was all manual, but they didn't realize all the other steps that was in there. So we had to move the review up a little quicker, make some changes to the process, and report on the data as they were going through it. And the end results were you know, huge success, big savings, and, and life got easier for, for, for them, you know, relatively short. So make sure that you, you, you kind of, you know, think about the data. Think about the different levels of, of management that might need the data and make sure that you're getting that um, pushed out to them. So now let's talk a little bit about pitfalls, um, as this young man here in the picture is about to experience. Um, so I highlighted you know, early on, spending too much time modeling as is, is is just really a waste of time. It's just not good use of your time. Um, do it more at a high level and then iterate with them about where you're going, what the to be is. Spend more time on the to be than the as is. Um, you know, excluding the, 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 the wrong people. When I say excluding, it's not that you're blocking them out, but, but if they're not being responsive and they're not coming into meetings and they're not partaking, you know, you're setting yourself up for, for uh, a level of potential um, failure. So you want to make sure that they're in, they're given their feedback, and they understand this is an iterative process that they have to go to together with you to, to achieve the success. Um, and again, I just talked about the, the failing to provide metrics and, and creating a baseline. Creating a baseline is really important. Whether Many times you can get the baseline right away uh, with the paper-based process or what are they have now, how they're processing, how long it takes. Um, sometimes there's service level agreements with these kind of um, situations. Any of that that you can document and lay out first is great, right? Do it. If not, do it right away once the, the, the system starts up and, you, and you're using it, getting that baseline. Because not only is this going to give great information to the cus uh, you know, whoever your customer is, whoever you're building the process for, um, and, and allow you to, to use that information as you reassess it, it's also going to bring value to you as the developer and as the life cycle, um, you know, patriarch there in your organization, right? It's going to show value to 
you know, all levels of management. And, and you can't do that without showing how you're making things better and how the, the process is, is, has been improved, right? Um, automating a badly designed process is another really key problem. I mean, if it's a poorly designed process and you put it in place, it's going gonna, it's gonna to automate poorly as well, right? So, so you have to make sure that you, you look at the process and, and, you know, make sure it's as efficient as possible. The scope creep, we all know about that one. Um, again, I kind of talked already on failing to identify goals and ROI, but, you know, these are things that you should be thinking about with the business. Put it in their terms. Get them to agree where they're at, what they want to be, and, and you know, this is how you're going to have great success that, that everybody, you know, applauds and, and, uh, and looks for. And then the last one is, you know, trying to build that perfect application. It's, you know, you just can't do it, right? You have to do these things, um, you know, iteratively, and, and, and it takes time uh, to, to work a process through and, and make sure it is. And, and you know, certainly the, the, the scope creep and trying to build the perfect application can really get out of hand. So, you know, keep things small, keep them iterative. Um, and keep it going and, and, and go for success. So now we're going to get um, moving over into, uh, and I apologize if I kind of went through some of those fast, but I'm trying to make sure I have time for, for um, some demos. So now we're going to kind of jump into to life cycle. We're going to open it up. Um, this is just a, an architecture um, slide from the, the, the Adobe site and, you know, just kind of refresher. We all know Adobe has, or Lifecycle has, you know, the service-oriented architecture with all the different, um, you know, document management pieces inside of there, rights management, you know, form server, digital signatures, all those kind of things. Um, you know, you can develop applications on it. Um, there's a, the workspace when we're talking about project uh, uh, management and uh, process management and, um, you know, we're going to look at some of that. But really, when you look at Lifecycle as a whole, as a, as a product set, it really doesn't do a whole lot right out of the box, right? It really doesn't do anything out of the box. It provides some services. You have to build out what you want to do with the services, build the templates, build the, you know, the, the service and expose, expose things. And that's how you're going to build value, um, you know, with these particular applications. So with that, let's jump over. So that's kind of a, you know, quick view of, of Lifecycle. Let's jump over and, and launch the tool. And, uh, and and we'll go through it. And actually, as you can see in front of you here, this is not Lifecycle. This is actually um, Smartphone Composer, which is uh, a product that, that Avoca has. Um, but this is what I started with to build my form, right? And, and so, a as you know, on the process, you know, many times when you're building the process, that's kind of the center point. It's the form that you're going to be using and moving through or forms. Um, and, and so I wanted to, to share with you what, what I did real quick. And so I'm going to open up this this uh, this form here in preview. And again, we can we can certainly at any time if you want to um, you know set up and understand more about how how our form school works or anything like that. You can you can certainly do that. But you could build the, the form and, and designer like you you might be doing today. Um, this just happened to be the tool I was using. So this is the form that I created. You can see I've got the PDF, and and this is kind of why I created it um, with composers. I wanted this navigation you know on the left and this capability um, that that um, you know, it's built in there. So the hide show logic. So if I come in and say phone, well, now I've got phone. If I computer related, I've got a computer tab that I might have to, to fill in here. So that's what I wanted into my application. And you'll also notice, um, you know, I've got things around here, uh, this help desk section. Um, the reason I wanted to show this is this is an internal only um, piece of the application. And, and so I built that into the one app. As you saw it when I was previewing it, we didn't see that section. Um, so that's why I'm bringing you through this is, is I wanted to, uh, to highlight that because that's one of the things that we're doing in the, in the process. Um, so basically, I built the form. I came over here. I got a schema based on that. And I got my PDF. And I dropped that into my application. Right. So that's kind of what I wanted to, uh, to set up for you there. So if we go into Lifecycle, um, process management, and actually it's a nice green, we'll, we'll give it a shot. Uh, so this is this is Workbench. So I've logged into Workbench. This is the tool, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with, with Lifecycle, this is the tool where you're going in and creating the application itself. Um, and this is where you're going to go in and create um, you know, your process and different things like that. And so to do that, uh, you can come in and say, well, I'm going to create a new application. 
so we'll say web demo finish. We'll drop that in place. You can see the application's been created. I can drop some folders in. This is some of the things you want to also think about. You know, have a have a base structure for all your applications. All your lifecycle applications should all kind of follow the same structure. Um, I like to have an assets folder, a forms or a templates folder, whatever you want to call it. And then I like to have a um, a folder where I put my processes. Um, if I'm using the data modeler, I, then I, I do the same thing um, there. So I try and break all those kind of things down. So if I've got images and other things that I'm going to use in my assets, that's where I put them and re refer to them into my application. So that's really important. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned before potentially using the uh, uh, the the actual workbench product to do your process. So if I said, well, here's my new process. Let's say I'm going to sit down with a with a potential customer um, to start working it through. Um, I could actually come in, start the the swim lane. You know, say, well, this is where the customer starts the form, right? And so I got that kind of information. You know, and I asked the person, well, what happens in this? Well, the customer, you know, fills out the form. So you can drop this abstract uh, on there. So I fill that out, and, and you can see I'm starting to build my, my process out. Um, obviously, it's not going to do anything, and I've got this little gray box here, and that's coming from the toolbar across the top. And what this does is really allows me to, to set different things in and then later define what they actually are. So the next thing they may say is, well, you know, they, they fill out the form, and then they, you know, this goes to the help desk, right? So you can say, okay, let's put another swim lane in, and we'll call this help desk. And the swim lanes are, are you know, they don't do anything for the, the actual um, process itself as, as it's running. But when you're talking to somebody and walking through um, the process, seeing the swim lanes and understanding that this is a handoff to a different group and different department really starts, you know, channeling their thoughts the way you want them to, to think, right? So we could say this is level one support. Um, you know, and you could start building out the, the, the process. And actually, you know, you can build the lines in there and, and do the things like that. You don't have to. Um, you can also, a lot of times, it's amazing how many processes I see where people don't use, you know, annotations, you know. So, um, you know, my note can go inside of here, and you can, you can just put these wherever you want and lay it out. These are great things for, you know, you, maybe you're not always going to be there to manage this process. This is going to be great things for, for people to come in and look at why you did something a certain way. You know, this is what this part of the process is doing. So annotate um, as much as you can, just as you would, uh, you know, code inside, you know, put in comments. You want to do the same thing for your processes. Uh, once you have these, um, these abstracts. If I wanted to come in and say, well, level one, now this is going to actually be a, a person. Um, I can actually, you know, define that, go choose what I want it to be. It'll ask me, do you want to change that? And you can see that it's now that step. And now I've got the, the accordions and all the things that are going to be around that particular user, right? So, so that's something that, you know, you might find helpful. You might be able to use um, as, you're, as you're modeling new processes um, and use that with, with people. So what I'm going to do, I've got a couple of processes that I've created. So I'm going to close the web demo, and you can see I've got a few of these out here. And so what I'm going to do is, is open the first one up. And this is kind of the, the, the process that I built. Um, the one I was just doing is a help desk process. That's that form that I was talking about. So there's my form that I put in place. And there's my uh, schema that was produced by Smart Form Composer for me as I was building, right? Um, so I just want to highlight a few things. Again, this is more of a tips and tricks as opposed to building the, the whole process out. But um, some of the things I see um, people not do is, um, so, so I'm going to open up this guy. So I, you see this little, so anytime you click on, for those who don't know, when you click on a particular action or an activity inside the map, you'll get this process properties over here on the side, right? Um, and a lot of people don't pay attention to this little filter. Um, that's what that is, uh, like a little funnel, but it's kind of the filter. By default, you're going to get basic, uh, and that's all the accordion pieces you get there. On a lot of those, you're going to want to click the all and, and be able to get to more information, right? And, and so that's one tip I'll, I'll make sure that you guys know. Um, another thing I see all the time is people drop you know, level one in there, they put the instructions in place um, and just use 
um, you know, static text or no text at all, right? Um, it's going to be more useful if you actually say, like here in this case, they're pretty small, but you know, help desk issue for you know the first name and the last name of this person. So now, when someone's looking at that item in their work queue, or it's a shared queue, they're going to be able to to see you know maybe what type of issue it is or who it belongs to, you know what the what the different. So you want to provide the information um, to that person as much as you can, right? And all these, you can set up different views as you, as you build the, the tools. But that's just as easy as coming in and doing you know, an insert expression. Um, because we're using a lifecycle process and because we've tied you know, the form data to our schema, it allows us to traverse the data. So this is all the data that's there on my form. It's very easy for me to go in and, and uh, you know, get to you know the contact info and if I want to add the phone number right there on it I can just double click that and now the phone number is going to be there as part of my instructions right so you can mix in static text with dynamic text and, and it'll do that so that's a that's a piece that you need to make sure you're doing for um, um, for your users another thing that I that I see quite often is lack of use for reminders um, escalations and deadlines and so it's amazing to me a lot of times I go in and talk to people and they don't even know it really even exists right um, so reminders are, are things like if you're doing approval processes with management who are not in this tool all the time you want to set up the reminder that they get right away and and then recurring reminders as well so it doesn't set stagnant in there right um, this is not their everyday tool you got to nag them with email to make sure they get it uh, and again the same thing can happen in here you can customize that text even down to including things right out of the form into that text in that email that they're going to get so so take advantage of that now in this particular case we're talking about a process where it's level one support so they're in the application all the time we don't want to do reminders and then that would just be a waste of, of their time but we might want to take advantage of things like escalations right and so escalations and deadlines are a little different when we talk about escalations, what that means is actually escalating this particular step. So I'm at the level one triage step. I want to escalate that particular step to someone else because of inactivity it hasn't been done with. So let's say in this case I've got a, a triage um, SLA that says I will address it within four hours or six hours. We'll say it's six hours. Um, so maybe at the four hour mark, I want to go ahead and and escalate it and I can choose the same things I do on an assignment I can choose um, to, to escalate it to a particular person to a particular group or, or use an XPath expression which I'll talk a little bit more about um, a little bit later but so so now I can say you know before something happens I can take this two-hour window where someone can get to the SLA we don't miss the SLA it costs us a lot of trouble we can escalate it up and, and let the, the automation tools do that for us right so that's a great thing for um, for you to keep in mind and then deadline is another one that that you want to um, keep in mind as, as a possibility so in this case you can see I've actually deadlined the, the item I've enabled it I basically said after one minute which you know, wouldn't make sense in the real world but um, you know basically after one minute I'm going to deadline and then choose this path to take and you can see the different paths these paths are the actual lines that are coming out of the, the step right and what that is basically saying is this particular step has passed its time uh, I want to move on right so so the same thing can happen in a in a help desk scenario where I'm about to miss my my SLA of, of service so right before it's supposed to, to, to expire you know so if it's at six hours you know mark maybe we say right at six hour, hour we send them an automated message um, saying, hey, you know, we've ex escalated it to level two for you, right? Even though no one really did anything, but the system saw we were going to fail, sent the email, and went ahead and escalated it up to level two. And now level two is starting to SLA. You know, from the customer's perspective, you know, we're moving things along, even though we really need to get our act together a little bit. So, so those are kind of things that you can do. Um, there's business calendars built into it. So if something's assigned on a Friday night and, you know, we don't work the weekends, you know, it'll take all that into consideration. And you can customize and build as many business calculator uh, calendars into uh, the system as you want. So there's an interface for that. Um, another uh, tidbit that a lot of people miss and, and, and don't see. Um, so the other thing I, I, I see a lot um, that people miss is around the, the pre-fill concept and, and so just to give you a taste what we'll do is go 
over here, I've got workspace open. So again, this is the tool where I'm going to go in and, and interface with my form. So I'm going to open up that particular form, and here you can see the uh, uh, the form that, that we've created over in Composer. We dropped it in. We can see it's workspace enabled. Uh, all the things that, that you know we want it to be are there, but I can see that it also is pre-populating some information, right? So how did that pre-population work? So at this particular step, I can come down and look at um, the presentation and data, and what you're going to see is this is the form that I want to use, and that's the form that I've got over my application, and I'm telling it to use an action profile called HD2, right? Um, so that was Help Desk 2 is what that stood for. But so very easy to go in and, and create that. You just go through a wizard. It creates basically what it does for you is it creates a process. So here we can open the, the HD2 process, and this is where you would um, build your query into your backend system or LDAP lookup or wherever you were going to get your pre-fill information from. Maybe it's even five systems you're going to pull it from. It's okay. Um, here I just use a set value to set uh, the, the you know um, different pieces into it. But um, you can see it, it gives me the um, prepared data, XML, and, and the task context. And so basically it's just a matter of just populating what I want for um, for those particular pieces, right? So, so very easy to go in and, and do pre-populations. If you're not doing um, doing those, then uh, you know you, you you should definitely be looking at it because it can save people a lot of time and and uh, and and they're really quite easy to put in into place. Okay, so I'm going to close this one out and open up another version of the application. You see I did different versions. So, and so what I wanted to highlight here was more around the the, um, the X path and the assignments around that. So it, it amazes me sometimes when I go into clients and look. Sometimes there's pretty elaborate uh, lookups and craziness going on just to figure out how to route to somebody. Or they, they're you know routing it to a group every time and someone has to figure things out. Um, you know, so so you can actually do some some uh, uh, intelligence by using the the X path uh, piece for the routing. So here is a is you know the same process really, if you will, but just looped. And I'm using one assignment to do all the different levels inside here. And so if I click on this, what we'll see is on the user selection, as opposed to routing it to a specific group like I was before, I'm actually saying route it to what is in the XPath expression. So, so Lifecycle is going to basically evaluate what I passed into it. And if I go over here to my set value, you can see I chose you know set the route to to this email address. Now this is something that I see a lot of people don't realize can happen. They, they think you have to go look up the actual you know group ID or the user ID and, and evaluate it and you know there's all kinds of services around doing that and, and many times you do want to do that. But in this case, I could just let I just put the email address in. When you go to this particular step, Lifecycle is going to look at what's in that email address, what group queue that's associated with or user, and it's going to evaluate it and route it to that person. So in this case, if I put an actual user ID in there, an email that's associated with, with a user, it's going to route to a user. In this case, it's a queue, um, so it's going to route to the, uh, the actual user. So actually, if we go over here and, and complete the form, um, oops. fill all my pieces of information in. You know, we'll actually see this one route over to you know the level one help desk um, that that you know I belong to, and so you know we can we can see uh, actually it didn't update so there it is so and we can see I've got my you know task information in there set for Jeff Clicky so I've got my instructions the way I want them to be and again if you remember we've got this deadline so here in a minute or so this is actually going to move out of that queue. And, and be done. So that's something that you may want to, to, to build in. You know, you can reuse these steps, and actually, you could take those steps um, and, and create those as as little service components that you could reuse into other processes as well, right? Um, so that's that's something to keep in mind. Um, so let me. So the next thing I wanted to show a tip around. Um, so I'm going to open up a. Same process that 
we did. But this time, what, what I've done is I was talking a little bit about um, about that reporting status, right? And so what I've done in this one is I've created another process um, that basically I just called store data so it's a decision point. But you know, using the data that that I'm passing over to this, I could update a table and, and write to a, or or call a web service to update another system. Whatever, however I'm getting the data into wherever I'm going to report from is the key point here. Um, so what I'm actually doing now is saying, okay, when this process starts, it's going to kick off, drop in, it's going to record that, record the stage as well, right? So my stage is already set to say that's the initial stage. Here's who did it. Here's what's going on. And then it routes to the person. Then as it escalates on up and it resets values, it rewrites that out. So each stage that I move to, each beginning SLA mark that I may have to make, put that on your process map, write that information out, and let them be able to report on it in real time. That's one way of doing it. Obviously, the data is in lifecycle. You can try and report from that. If you have uh, business activity monitoring um, set up and you're using that, that may work for you. Um, that's really an activity monitoring more than a reporting, and most departmental level people and things like that, they want reporting. They want things that are going to tell them how well their people are performing and how much backlog they've got and how much work they've done so they can report up. Um, you know, to their management. So those are the, the things that you want to uh, um, you want to do, right? Is give them that information, and these are ways you can do it. And again, it doesn't have to be in a loop. It could be strung out on any one of the process maps I saw. You, you could you could build that out. Uh, and again, this is just the actual um, process that I created, and it's defined with different inputs that I'm putting in place. And again, you can see I've used X paths on each one of these. Um, now, one of the things that people don't know about sometimes. I'm going to come down here back over to this person one and I'm going to look at the output section. So a lot of times people don't realize that you can come in on a user step and actually record the task results, right? And what this is going to do, um, it's going to allow me, like if we go back over and look at this one, I'm actually taking the task results and getting who completed it, where it was. So there's a wealth of information that's into that um, that piece. So by having that task result stored, again, I could do it. I get you know what attachments were in there, um, who completed it, what was their you know actual common name, you know what was their user ID, what the email address. Um, you know sometimes you may need to store this in a variable and route it back to them. You know 20 steps later in the process, and this is going to allow you to do that, as well as get valuable information about when it was grabbed, when it was worked, when they finished this particular step. Um, so you can do cycle times and push that out to, to your reporting pieces. So these are some of the things that, that as you're building your process, you want to think about and make sure you're taking advantage of, right? And, and they're built in there. Um, you just kind of have to take it. You just kind of have to enable them and, and, and take advantage of them. Uh, and again, the inputs that I'm using here on this particular reporting, that's just what I chose to do. Um, you can pull whatever you want. You could even push whole XML sections over. Um, I was just trying to show, you know, the simplicity of it. Um, all right, so the next thing I kind of want to highlight real quick that people miss um, uh, all the time, and a lot of people don't even know this this capability is in there, is events, right? And so here I've just created a, a process uh, or an application with just a process folder because that's all I did was create some processes. Um, and so I've got two different processes. I'm going to open those up so you can kind of see them. And so here I've got process. It doesn't do anything except go to a step, decision point, waits for a couple minutes, and then goes to an end, right? That's all it's doing. And then if I look at this process, um, it's doing an execute and then throwing an event, right? And then I've got this custom event here. And so when we look at an event, what this is is something that you can go in and define for the system. So I went in and, and created one um, called demo event. I created a schema that's going to go along with it that's going to store data that can be passed um, you know, with that event, and then you can also have message data that you're going to pass as far as the message goes, um, and then there's some configuration you can have about housekeeping and what it does with the event information. But to give you a, a simple idea of what's going to happen here, I'm going to start this process. It's going to run over and throw the event. And so if I invoke this process, and a lot of people don't know this sometimes, you can invoke a process directly from Workbench. So I click right, click on it, invoke it. And now it's gone through the, the step, and, and it, 
has gone over to our event demo and, and run that. Now, one of the things you can do, you'll notice a little red dot that I've got on those. And what that is is process recording. That's another thing that some people don't know about. This is a great tool um, as you're working through uh, debugging things and, 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 and showing things. Um, I'll open this one up, and you can see that this process was caught here on our event catch and then routed in and moved through. And I can step through this. We can see right here we're still running in the process. We're at our wait time, and so it's still going, right? And so that's, um, you know, that's kind of seeing a, an event in action. We saw it come from one process, throw an event, and, and you know, kick it off here. Now, if I open this event properties, you can see what I'm doing. I'm saying, okay, any event that comes with this PO number of 111, so I hard code this. You typically want to make this data driven off of the data inside or process ID, whatever it's going to be. Um, that's when I'm going to start this process. And if I go over here and look at this throw event, we're going to see a very same thing in the sense that I'm throwing an event with a PO number of 111. So that's how I'm kind of tying together. So you could tie those together with process ID, um, you know, different things like that. Um, now, I'm going to actually open up, I'm going to go back up to my first process that we did and show you something else that people don't realize with events. So let's say in this case, I've got a process that is routing here. We can see we route to level one triage. Um, I send, let's say I've got a step inside of here that sends an email to the person that says, hey, we got your, your, your help desk item, we're working on it. Um, if you want to cancel the request, click here on the link, right? And so that could start a process that would throw an event. So I could actually take an event and drag it onto the actual step here, right? And then go into, um, you know, the, the, the event and, uh, and say there's my demo event. And then I could say, get it where, you know, this is, again, this is the uh, looking at my, uh, my data that I put inside of there. And again, I can do the, the literal inside of here. But now if that event's throwing while level one triage has it, I can say, now come out of this event capture and go to the end because it's going to end that process, right? Um, because he canceled on his own. Now, I probably wouldn't want to go to that end. I'd probably want to send a note to, you know, an email to the person saying, you know, we're confirming or cancel. If you didn't mean this, you know, send it back in. You may want to put all kinds of safety checks, but a lot of people don't realize that this kind of functionality is built into the process management suite. You can build those, and they don't have to be um, person-based. You can drop these type of, of events and exceptions on short-lived processes, on anything that you want to do. And then another thing that people don't, pay attention to sometimes is this little lightning bolt that's down at the bottom. And that's not a cool design. What that is is actually exception handling. So if I want to route um, you know, something on side of here, if I get an invalid um, principle, which means I couldn't find who you're wanting to route it to, and as we all know, if you're doing process management, that'll stall until you go fix it. Well, I could actually build that in. Maybe my, you know, I'm using the XPath and, and I didn't get a valid uh, piece of information there. I could basically then route it. Um, you know, to the, you know, so I probably wouldn't want to route it like I did right there to, to an end, um, but I could, I could choose to route it to, uh, you know, maybe it just goes on to, to, you know, level two, right? And so now, if I don't find who level one should be, it'll just escalate directly up to level two and, and, and move that, that piece out, right? So, so just more things you can do with building out um, your actual process, right? All right, and so I know we're running short on time. The last thing I want to show real quick is what happens in a process if you want to actually extend that um, out to outside users, right? So we know Lifecycle does a really good job with workspace and, and, and handles um, things out. But if you want to actually take that form um, and, and push it out to a self-service portal, this is some of the things that, that – uh, Avoca has created in their product set. And so I could actually come out, um, I can self-register. So again, this is outside of my LDAP. This is not my internal. This is an outside um, focused piece. But now I can access that exact same form. And one of the other things I liked about using you know, the Composer tools as opposed to Designer is now this is an actual HTML5 form. So the same design we just did um, is working out over here. I've still got pre-fill capability. 
Um, and I can come in and say, you know, well, this is a low priority. It's a phone item. I'm going to see all the same things that I was seeing before. The difference is, is this is outside. But when I hit submit, I get this confirmation. I can get a, a, a receipt capability so I can actually see, you know, what went on with this particular item. So with the one design gives me the flattened form. But it's also going to um, give me the ability to see what's going on in the back end. So this receive status, this came from Lifecycle. So Lifecycle is already talking back to me to let me know that the process is being received and it's being worked on. And if we go over into to Workspace, we can see there's the level one triage that just came in. So now we've tied it directly to our back end. Um, they can go in and say, yep, this is what I want. I'm going to claim and open it. And you know, there's the form and they can go through and start working through and say, well, I've resolved the issue or in this case I ended it, work through the item. And, and you know, very easily to, to, to go in and, and do, uh, you know, basically extend this kind of functionality out to um, the outside world. So I know that was a lot to, to cram in uh, in a short amount of time, but hopefully that um, highlight some of the different things that you can do with the um, with the lifecycle process management and with some of the evoca tools as well uh, you know hopefully there was some some good uh, the good information um, inside of that Wow Jeff that was terrific that's a lot of information all right so well we we'll opened up the last there. You open up the last poll, and this is while people are filling out the poll, that would be great. And uh, we've also, this is a great time for you all to be adding your questions. Not only do we have Jeff here uh, uh, to answer questions for you, but also our CTO, Howard Traceman, is also on the line to answer questions. So uh, if you've got questions related to process management, maybe things you're working on that you just can't figure out, maybe things you saw in the demo today, now is the time to. Uh, to get those questions into the chat box, into the, uh, the, the question I, the pod, and we'll get those answers right back to you. All right, Jeff, why don't we uh, publish the poll here? You did pretty good today, I'd say. Okay. So thank you, 60% almost a great use of time, and almost 40% good use of time. So thank you very much. I think Jeff did a terrific job here. This is a very meaty uh, session, lots of information here. So. Uh, Jeff, why don't we go to the Q&A and we'll start answering these. Now, some of them are directly related to where you are, were in specific parts of the demo, so I'm not sure. Okay. You know, so how did you get the events tab beside the process properties in the workbench? So that was in your demo one. So basically, the, the events tab can be, you can, you can right click and say new event um, anywhere in your application. Um, up on your process screen as well, when you're building the process map, there's an event icon up there, it's, a, it's the circle, and you drag the circle down and from there it'll let you define a new custom event. There's also a lot of events that are built into Lifecycle already that are there that you can start using right away, right? So there's a lot of task management, um, content management, and template management and things like that built into it. So you may even find events that you can take advantage of uh, right out of the box. Excellent. And another question from Nish, which is, does this reminder present to the user in the workspace? So the reminders that, that are going to happen there, those are going to be email-based um, reminders. Uh, if you're wanting something that's more like a toast pop-up uh, in the bottom of you know, the user's um, tray, though obviously if they're in Workspace, they're going to see the item pop up, right? They're going to see that right away. But if you're looking for that toast kind of thing, that's something that Avoca has. I think you can even download it directly from the website and use that. So we've got a, a Workspace alerter as well. Um, but what I was showing, those notifications were actual uh, emails that we were sending out. Excellent. Another question, where does the deadline show up for the user? In the workspace? So if, if an, and I think what they mean, so if I define the deadline as a step and then, and then that particular item gets deadlined and it's pushed out, and let's say I had it in my workspace, what I'm going to have is, is, a, is an item with a red clock on it, and that's going to let me know as a user that an item has been taken out of my queue, it was deadlined out, and so I can see that if I click on it, I can get it to go away, but it lets me know why I don't see that in my queue anymore, um, and then the process goes about however you define the process. Great. Joel would like to know, what is the advantage of throwing and catching an event versus just making an asynchronous call of the process you have defined uh, with the event catch? Yeah, and so in my example that I showed where, where I was starting a new process, there's 
you, absolutely, you wouldn't want to do it with events. There's no advantage. You would just chain the process and put that subprocess in there. And that's why I went back in and showed you more of an example of where you want to throw an event. Um, maybe I need to stop something. Um, you know, and I'll tell you a couple of practical uses where I've seen this um, being used. So let's say you've got in one one place I was working with a customer. They had an approval cycle that uh, managers had to do, right? But it, they also it routed in parallel. So hopefully you guys know about gateways. You can create gateways and route in parallel. They routed to the VP for approval as well. Now they never really expected him to approve anything. He didn't, he wasn't on the hook to do anything. As soon as the managers went through their chain, the process would move on. But if the VP did log in, did look at it, and did approve it, they no longer needed any of the managers to approve it. So events would basically fire and take those out of the queue and, and move them in. So that's one way you might use events. Another thing is maybe you've got documents that you're waiting to be mailed back into your organization. Events are a great way to trigger that. Hey, I got it and and come back in and tie these two processes together. So events have their, their need, and, and certainly that simple one I showed was probably not the best uh, use of it. AJ would like to know, and I don't know if you would answer to this, what is the tool used to read the JBoss logs? I remember Angie mentioned the tool name, but I don't remember it now. <laughs> so that's Beartail is, is the one that we use all the time. So it's there you a, go, AJ. A free tool. Uh, Siri would like to know, it was mentioned Evoca's product creates HTML5 forms, so does that mean that Lifecycle Designer does not render in HTML5? Um, uh, currently today, that is correct. That is correct. Uh, Glenn would like to know, location of recording. Oh, <laughs> uh, Glenn, we'll send you out a, uh, an email tomorrow uh, that will give you the location. In fact, I showed you the page earlier today, www.evoca.com slash recordings.html is where you'll find this recording tomorrow, but you'll also get a, a reminder email tomorrow that uh, lets you know that as well. Uh, Nish would like to know, can you explain escalation again and how it can be used as a simple example? Okay, so the, again, the big difference between escalation and deadline, the way to think about deadline is deadline is actually moving from that step and moving on to a new step. Escalating is actually keeping it at that same step but reassigning it to someone else because we're going to move it you know, up the chain. So typically it's, a, it's an assignment like to a manager or to a specialist or back into a group queue, whatever the case may be, whatever you want your process to be, but that's what it's doing. It's still at that. So in our case, we, we escalated from level one triage it would still be level one triage as a step. It just is basically changing the owner. And all you're doing in, in the escalation point is pointing to who you want it to go to or using the XPath um, to, 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 to figure out who you want it to go to. And so, so many times what we see all the time is, is um, looking up into the user. Uh, remember I showed you, you how you can get the user details, looking up who their manager is, and then based on that XPath, escalating it to their manager. That's a really common one you see all the time. Nice. And the last question we have in the pod today is, does this integrate easily into other platforms, uh, Lotus, SharePoint, et cetera? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's one of the, the, the great things about Lifecycle is its integration capabilities. And there's already SharePoint connectors and, and um, things around that. So uh, there's web service connectors built in out of the box. There's, you know, database connectors. And again, it's, if you can integrate, if you you know as long as the system you're going to has some way to get to it, you can build an integration point, um, and you can build your own components. Or you know as you build a service, every service you create uh, inside of Lifecycle exposes itself as a web service and can be called in that service-oriented architecture from other applications. So Lifecycle amazingly well fits into to uh, to your your service-oriented architecture and should work great for that, right? Uh, Owen, uh, we just saw one more in. Can this connect to an Oracle database? Absolutely. So, of course. Absolutely. All right, everyone. We're an hour and 52 seconds into this, so I want to thank you all for attending this. This is the last webinar in this particular um, uh, session of our Lifecycle webinars. Uh, we're going to go away and brainstorm. We've got some other ideas. Uh, and we'll, um, we'll send you some email once we have those ideas ready to go. So thank you very much for joining us today. Jeff, thank you a lot. That was a, a tremendous um, a session you put together for us. Howard, thanks for getting up so early in the morning to join us today. And um, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.